<laughs> Next up is this amazing, amazing woman. Her name is Madison Salovec. Uh, right? All right, so so she's she's kind of a big deal. Um, she, uh, oh God, I'm blanking out. What did she say? Her old person thing is that she, she thought that I wouldn't know this, uh, that she has a bird app on her phone that she uses to listen to the birds in her yard before she falls asleep. Of course I know this bird app. It is the Merlin bird app. Um, and you should all have it if you don't already. So it is so good. You just like hold it up and it will hear bird noises and then it will pop up a picture of the bird and give you like the 30 different sounds that it makes. I in, encourage you to go like to Half Moon Farm and listen to birds there or the arsenal or out here, wherever. There are so many birds, you guys. And Madison listens to like all of them. And there's another fact that I totally blanked on. So we're going to pretend I'm not opening up this piece of paper. I'm being very subtle about it. Oh, her favorite sandwich. It has nothing to do with sauce. Uh, it, <laughs> however, it does have to do with, oh man. Uh-oh, sandwich drama. Prosciutto. <laughs> Brie, arugula, figs, on focaccia. Let's go! Sexy sandwich. Sauce, also sexy, different. <laughs> Still sexy. All right, we're going to bring Madison out. Please, raucous applause. Uh, very exciting. I am wearing bike shorts, so. <laughs> all right, this is a story about my first autistic birthday. It is also a story about resilience, creativity, and hope. I'll start by telling you why my first autistic birthday was a little more than three decades late, and that is because I'm a child of the 90s, and the internet and autism research was not what it is today, so I was missed, and instead I grew up labeled as highly sensitive, extremely dramatic, and only a little weird, which was a little insulting, um, but later in life, I got the title of mentally ill, which is not entirely untrue. I found out I was autistic when I was dealing with a health crisis that left me in chronic pain and also had me slip into a really deep depression I wasn't sure I would get out of. And then I saw the stats, and they did not inspire hope, but this talk does. So the worst thing about the stats about autistic people, autistic women specifically, dying a lot more often from suicide was that it made perfect sense to me. It showed me the path that I was on and I didn't want to be on anymore. So I channeled this little girl and I realized that she never even had a chance to grow up with her own needs centered in her experience. And even still, I turned out like this, okay? I did a lot in my life, but I did a lot of it without some crucial information about how I operate. So I dug deep and I just thought, if I could get this far without it, imagine what I could build with it. I knew it was going to take a fuck ton of work. So I packed up, moved from the city out to the suburbs to reduce my sensory input. Even though I was out of work already for eight months, I withdrew my life savings so that I could afford to make healing my full-time job. And I made star charts to get myself out of depression by giving myself a gold foil star every day I did something little girl me would have been excited to get out of bed. I meditated, I got super into paint by numbers, made a gallery in my garage, and I hand cut my grass. It was the hardest I've ever worked and the loneliest I've ever been, minus my dog Omar. But here I am today, this is me practicing for this moment, which proves, thank you, that my DIY rehab worked. <laughs> And that healing is possible. I'm so proud of how far I had come. I was starting to feel myself again, and I wanted to celebrate, and this time my birthday was coming up. But I had to stop and think, what does this look like now that I know I'm autistic? Because it turns out I don't really like parties. I definitely don't like birthdays. Um, and sometimes I don't like people. So I invented the silent disco art party, which was actually a series of small gatherings because I don't like the pressure of a big day. And I don't like big crowds. 
I've had a silent disco party in the past. I've had several. I love dancing without interruption and the opportunity to change the channel on the vibe. The thing is, before I knew I was autistic, my silent discos had way too many people and way too many substances. So this year we revised. Chronic illness will keep you from being on your feet all night, so there needed to be a second activity. That's where the art came in. And that felt really special to me because it was a vulnerable way to share what I had been doing with my time with my friends without a story time. I also made sure that the party was catered to my tastes, literally. I have a hard time regulating my blood sugar, and I'm excited. So we had the most plain nachos, as well as watermelon slushies and s'mores, which don't go together, but I ate all of them and was very satisfied. <laughs> I also made sure that the parties were adequate for my dog, Omar, because he was the real MVP of this healing story. Watching my friends dig into my art supplies was the greatest gift I could have ever asked for. Seeing their faces light up as they made creative decisions and mixed new colors and encouraged each other was everything my inner child dreamed of and everything my adult version self needed. Each one of my friends as they left told me that this was the party, this was the experience that they needed, but they wouldn't have set it up themselves. Which is a big compliment, because both of these pictures were taken at the same time, just five feet away from each other, okay? I created an experience that was filled with choice, as well as a lot of really basic human needs. In fact, I learned that the party I so carefully curated around my special needs was actually really centered around my human needs. Just like my friends who swelled with pride as I took their picture holding their artwork and hanging in my garage gallery, I realized that I too have a desire to create and to try new things and take risks without judgment. I too desire a place to be held and admired just for trying. And no matter how I turn out, I want somebody to put me up and say, look at this work of art. It is my hope for the future that my garage gallery continues to grow with contributors, that this is the best year of my life, and that we as a society begin to create spaces and celebration that center our human needs and make it much more accessible to heal together. Thank you.